tonight you're all here for, I think, a remarkable evening with Lisa C. Um, she wrote these beautiful books, books before this one she's going to talk about tonight. It's about China. Um, you will hear more about it, but I just want to tell you that it's her first stop for this book in Europe, and we're the first ones to hear her. It, the book is already sold in 24 countries. It's amazing, and it has very, very good reviews um, in America already. She's been on a big book tour for, I believe, four weeks now. And I'm sure that everybody will tell you in a couple of weeks when they all, the journalists here are ready to write their critics that you will say, hey, I've seen her already because it's amazing what, you, what you've done. Um, I'm very happy that uh, we have also a premiere here with Suzanne Smith. Suzanne uh, is not only a journalist, um, she's an author, and she's also a bit of a TV personality for Goedemorgen Nederland. I'm happy that she's here. It's um, an honor that uh, she wants to um, moderate tonight's discussion and give a brief introduction before Lisa C. will speak. Elena's Flucht, and that's another premiere tonight because we have it already for sale here, and she's also told me that she will sign books if you like. But that's all after the show tonight. Um, I want to ask you to switch off your mobile phones, refrain from smoking during the speech, and um, may I welcome Suzanne Smith to take the floor. Thank you. Oh, I know what you mean with the holes. <laughs> this is not built for women on heels. <laughs> um, when I first heard about uh, Lisa C's book, Snowflower, and The Secret Fan, I thought it was a fairy tale. My, uh, the jacket of my advanced reading copy had flowers and, uh, and uh, birds on it, but once I started reading, it became clear to me that it wasn't a fairy tale or a mythical love story. The story is set in 19th century China, where girls and women have their feet bound uh, in a ritual of beauty that started at age six and took two full years to complete. Uh, their feet were crushed into a size of, a, of lily flowers. Uh, from foot binding forward, onward, girls and women live secluded in a second story chamber of their household. That is not something to be romantic about. Yet, it is a love story, not about a man and a woman, but about two women who um, deeply connect to one another and develop a beautiful friendship. Their relationship is sometimes warm, sometimes troubled, sometimes filled with jealousy, and even at times erotic. Reading for me is about uh, living alternative lives and um, learn about extraordinary settings, and this book certainly provides that. It's a deeply affecting story, elegantly written, and she is not only um, bringing out a character, but an entire culture. And I am not the only uh, book critic or writer that feels that way. Amy Tan, among others, uh, author of the Joy Luck Club, said about this book, Lisa C. has written her best book yet. Snowflower and the Secret Fan is achingly beautiful, a marvel of imagination of a real and secret world that has only recently disappeared. It is a story so mesmerizing, the pages float away and the story remains clearly before us from beginning to end. Well, Lisa C. Um, uh, has uh, a, n a number of other books uh, on her name. Uh, she was born in Paris, but grew up in Los Angeles spending much of her time in Chinatown. And her first book is called On Gold Mountain, The 100-Year Odyssey of My Chinese-American Family. It was a bestseller in the United States. The book is about Lisa C.'s great-grandfather, Fang Si, who became the 100-year-old godfather of Los Angeles Chinatown. And when she was a girl, Lisa C. spent summers in her family's antique store in that same uh, in the same family. And there, her grandmother and great aunt told her intriguing and colorful stories about their family's past. Stories of missionaries, of concubines, racist laws, and discrimination. They spoke of how Lisa's great-great-grandfather immigrated from his Chinese village to the United States to work on 
the transcontinental ro railroad as a herbalist, and they talked of how his son followed him. Married a Caucasian woman, and despite great odds, went on to become one of the most prominent Chinese on Gold Mountain, which is a Chinese name for uh, the United States. As an adult, C spent years collecting the details of her family's remarkable history. She interviewed nearly 100 relatives, both Chinese and Caucasian, and read documents at the National Archives and several historic societies. During this time, uh, the idea of Snowflower emerged. She's written also three, uh, three thrillers, Flower Net, from which the rights, the foreign rights were sold to 14 countries, The Interior, and Dragon Bones. Also, she was the publisher's weekly West Coast correspondent for 13 years. As a freelance journalist, her articles have appeared in Vogue, the New York Times Book Review, and the Los Angeles Times Magazine. The Organization of Chinese American Women named her the 2001 National Woman of the Year. She lives with her husband and two sons in Los Angeles currently. But today she's in Holland, uh, celebrating the Dutch edition of the book. And uh, well, let's please welcome Lisa C to the stage. Well, I'm very nervous about this I think milk crate I'm on. Thank you so much for having me here. This is so wonderful, um, but I'm a little shocked by your weather. Uh, I was expecting something a little cooler, and so we can all feel like we're in China right now in the middle of summer because this is, this is a very Chinese kind of weather we're having. I'm going to talk a little bit and then do a very short reading, and then Susan and I are going to have a conversation. So. I'd like you to cast your minds back in time, not too far, only to the mid-1960s, to a rural Chinese train station where an old woman in her 80s fainted. And the police came and they looked through her belongings and they found these little pieces of paper with what looked to be a secret code written on them. Well, this was the height of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. They were very suspicious and they promptly arrested that old woman put her in jail temporarily, and in the meantime, they contacted and brought in scholars, cryptographers, and different kind of linguists, different people who could see if they could break this code. Well, they did break the code, only it turned out that it wasn't a code that was used for espionage. It was actually a secret language writing system that had been invented by women, used by women, and kept a secret by women in one very remote county in China for a thousand years. But again, this was the height of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and so all of those scholars and linguists and cryptographers were promptly arrested and sent to labor camp and to farm camps where they stayed and did not reemerge until the mid-1980s. Once they came out, they once again pursued their study of nushu, it means women's writing, and um, gradually word got out a little bit into China, but not that much, and gradually a little bit got out to the rest of the world, including the United States. I first heard about nushu when I reviewed a book for the Los Angeles Times on the history of foot binding. And in that book, there was a very short three or four page mention of nushu, and I thought, how could this exist? And I didn't know about it, because I guess I'm a little bit of an egomaniac. And then I thought, well, how could this exist? And we all didn't know about it. Because so often, I think we hear about women in the past that, well, you know, there were no women writers, there were no women artists, there were no women architects, there were no women chefs, there were, no, there were women, but I guess they weren't doing anything. Except, of course, we know that they were doing things. It's just that what they did was forgotten or lost or sometimes covered up. But here was an example of something, that it was the women themselves who had invented this, had used it, but they were the ones who had kept it a secret. So I just was amazed and kind of obsessed by that. But I also had a, a feeling a more personal connection. I, as you heard, I grew up in a very large Chinese-American family. My great-great-grandfather came here, to, or came, 
not here, but came, went to the United States to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, I like to think of this man as one of the original, I wonder if you have this phrase, deadbeat dads, someone who uh, he, he was, what he was supposed to do was work hard, save money, and send his money home back to China for his family, but instead he had a fondness for women and gambling, something that continues in our family to this day, and as a result, his wife back in China was so poor that she used to carry people on her back from village to village to support her children. And finally, people took pity on, my, on her and her children and lent my great-grandfather the money to go to the Gold Mountain, where he found his dad and said, you know, Dad, you're a bum, go home, and he did. And my great-grandfather stayed and did a lot of the jobs that immigrants do even today, no matter where they are in the world. He washed dishes in restaurants, he swept up in factories, um, he worked in the fields, but by the time he was 30, in the 1890s in Sacramento, California, he had his first business. It was a business that made crotchless underwear for brothels. <laughs> Everybody has to have their beginning in America. That was ours, you know? <laughs> so I, I, my great-grandfather had four wives, one of whom was Caucasian in California and in many of the states. It was against the law for Chinese and Caucasians to marry, so they went to a lawyer who drew up a contract between two people um, forming a partnership. And eventually they moved to Los Angeles, and well, I don't want to spend much time on this other than to say that after another hundred years to when I was a little girl, um, I probably had about, and have today, about 400 relatives in Los Angeles, of which there are about a dozen that look like me, and the rest are still full Chinese. And so I grew up in this very large, very traditional Chinese family in which certain kinds of things were said about girls and women all the time. Um, things like, when a girl, obey your father. When a wife, obey your husband. When a widow, obey your son or it's better to have a dog than a daughter. Now my cousins and I, we all grew up hearing it. We all fought against that kind of thinking. We resisted it. We went out and did all kinds of things, some of them good, some of them pretty bad. Uh, but no matter what you do, and no matter how much you resist, some of that sinks in. You can't help it. And so coming back to Snowflower, and when I heard about this language, I thought how remarkable it was that these women who had grown up under, and as you'll see, under much, much harsher circumstances than I had, had in fact been able to sort of break through that and come up with this secret language so that they could write about their lives. So anyway, I was obsessed. And I did a little research on the internet and I found some things. And then I did a little research at libraries, university libraries, and I found a couple of things. But it didn't really solve this passion that I had developed. So I thought, well, there's only one thing I can do. I have to go to China and I have to find out more. So I did travel to Jianyang County. It's in southwestern Hunan province. I was told I was only the second foreigner ever to go there. There's some good sides and bad sides to something like that. The good side is it's a very remote place. Um, no trains, no planes, no boats. It's very remote and so, of course, very pristine, very beautiful, gorgeous. The downside, that's the upside. The downside is, you know, no hot water and eating things like pig penis. Uh, which isn't as, you know, I have to tell you, it's not so bad. It's a lot like chicken, only chewier, okay? So you just, you have to be brave about it. But um, while I was there, I was walking, mostly walking from village to village. They were a half a mile, a mile apart, and talking to different people and going into people's houses. I was able to meet and talk to, at that time, the oldest living new shoe writer. She was a woman who at that time was 96 years old, the oldest living new shoe writer. She was t just, well, of course, I'm on a box, so I'll just pretend she's standing on the box next to me. She was just this little tiny, tiny, shrunken woman. Um, 
and you know, obviously very old. Her skin was so thin, it was like tissue paper. She'd lost most of her hair. She had bound feet, but she could no longer um, find bound foot shoes to buy, and her hands were so crippled by arthritis that she couldn't make them herself anymore. So she wore child-sized kung fu slippers with tissue stuffed in the toes. And she sat there and she talked to me about the time before she had her feet bound, what that foot binding was like, what it was like to marry out sight unseen into her husband's home in an arranged marriage, what her sworn sisterhood was like, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, and then finally how important this secret language had been to her. But as I said, I, I did go and talk to a lot of people and, and traveled around in this area. And here's what I learned. For about a thousand years across China, the women were illiterate. For about a thousand years across China, the women had bound feet. Now it's been interesting to me as I've been traveling first in the US, actually for the last eight weeks, uh, to sort of get hear how people think about foot binding. A lot of people have this idea that what happened was that a mother would take her little girl and wrap her daughter's feet in these long strips of cloth and then her feet just wouldn't grow. Kind of like the bonsai theory of foot binding, right? It just, they wouldn't grow. But that's not what it was at all. What would happen was that a mother would take her daughter at age five, six, seven years old, wrap the toes underneath the foot, wrap them in these long strips of cloth, and then make this little girl walk back and forth across what was known as the woman's chamber, this room upstairs in, in the house. Uh, make this little girl walk back and forth across the room week after week after week until those bones broke, and then they would make her walk some more. And then the bones would be pulled under the foot, the foot pulled under tighter, tighter, wrapping those bindings tighter every four days. And that girl, little girl again, five, six, seven years old, made to walk back and forth across this woman's chamber, again, week after week after week, until the bones in her midfoot broke, and then she was made to walk some more. So the goal was to take the toes and have them come back and meet the heel of the foot so that all that a little girl and then later as a woman would be left to walk on was basically her big toe. So the way to visualize the ideal sized bound foot is just to look at your own thumb. It was about one inch wide and about three inches long. Out of this culture of foot binding in this one county, two types of relationships developed. The first was called a sworn sisterhood, and this was when in one particular village, all the mothers would gather their little girls who were having their feet bound, four, five, six girls, and these little girls would form a sworn sisterhood. And they would go upstairs to what was called the woman's chamber, a room that just had this one window to look out of, and there these little girls would learn their embroidery, they'd work on their weaving, um, they'd work on their dowries together, and they would learn the secret language. When they were 17 years old, they would marry out sight unseen to other villages, move into the upstairs chamber in that house, again a room with just one window to look out of, and there they would remain until they died. When the girls married out at age 17, the sisterhood dissolved. And the only memory that these girls would have of their friendship would be these special books and letters and sometimes embroideries that had this secret language, stories, letters, songs, poems, um, things like that. But there was another kind of relationship that developed and this was much more rare. Same thing, a little girl is maybe six or seven years old, having her feet bound. And already the matchmakers are coming to villages and looking for little girls in this village to match to little boys in other villages around the county. And sometimes a mother would pull the matchmaker aside and say, can you find another little girl in another village who can match eight characteristics, born on the same day, in the same birth order, with the exact same size foot, eight things that had to match, obviously hard to find. 
But if that other little girl could be found, the two of them would be brought together. They would sign a contract becoming Lao Tong, it means old sames, for life. And again, these girls would move up to the upstairs chamber, they'd work on their embroidery, they'd work on their dowries, they'd learn the secret language together. When they were 17, they would marry out sight unseen to other villages. But unlike the sworn sisterhood that dissolved upon marriage, the Lao Tong relationship was for life. And so these two girls, now women, would be able to visit each other throughout the year and more importantly, they would be allowed to write to each other in this secret language. So to me, what was so amazing about this was that no one had expected these women to have an intellectual thought. No one expected these women to be creative in any way. No one expected or wanted them to show any type of emotion and yet through this secret language, they were able, in a sense, to fly out of that one window, reach across the fields, and find other women that they could talk to, that they could share their lives with, and who would share their lives with uh, it back in return. So while I was in China, this story did begin to form in my mind. Uh, using a little bit of Yang Wanying, the woman who was 96 years old, as well as my grandmother and my uh, great aunts, of a woman who would be looking back on her life and remembering that time, the freedom she had before her foot binding, what her foot binding was like, uh, what it was like to marry out into a house of total strangers, uh, and how much this special language had meant to her and to her old same. I had three ideas, main ideas in mind. I wanted to write about friendship, love, and regret. And I think it's an interesting thing about friendship. You know, we always hear how uh, important friendship is to women. I, mean, I think that's a very common, sort of a common um, thing. We all, you know, we all hear it. We all say, oh yes, you know, our women friends are so important. But interestingly enough, if you look at the body of literature that's out there, there are more novels written about male friendship than there are actually about the deep levels of female friendship. And I thought a lot about that and, and why that is. And I think it's because I'm sorry to say I don't know enough about Dutch to know if this is true, but in English we have one word to talk about love. And you can say, or I could say, I love my husband, I love my children, but I also love the color purple, I love hamburgers, I love, uh, you know, I mean you, you use that, or at least in English, you use this same word to describe a whole host of, of feelings about how you do love something. And I really, in, in, in Chinese, on the other hand, the language is very rich and has different ways of looking at love, of describing love, and there's going to be a little bit of that in this reading. And I thought that was very intriguing to try to look at these different ways that we love people, love things, and see if I could incorporate that. And then finally, wherever I believe that wherever there's love, just underneath that is regret, or is bound to come some regret. Because who among us can get through life without having regrets? Um, so, I'm just going to read to you from the very opening pages of this novel. Uh, what do you need to know? This is written in the form of an autobiography that was one of the standard Nushu forms very common form, one of the most common forms. Uh, I have to read to you from the beginning because it's not called Snowflower and the Secret Fan for nothing. There are some secrets in here and they come up pretty quickly. I don't want to give any of them away. And then finally, um, when a woman died, all of her friends would gather together and they would take everything that this woman had ever written or had been written to her and they would burn it at her gravesite, all of her writings. And this had the purpose of, of traveling with her, allowing the words to travel with her to the afterworld, where they served not only as an introduction 
of this woman to the afterworld, but was also, uh, they were also sent to keep her company for all eternity in the afterworld. But they also had one other side effect, which was it was a way to help keep this a secret um, because very little of this writing survived past a woman's death. I am what they call in our village one who has not yet died, a widow, 80 years old. Without my husband, the days are long. I no longer care for the special foods that Peony and the others prepare for me. I no longer look forward to the happy events that settle under our roof so easily. Only the past interests me now. After all this time, I can finally say the things I couldn't when I had to depend on my natal family to raise me or rely on my husband's family to feed me. I have a whole life to tell. I have nothing left to lose and few to offend. I am old enough to know only too well my good and bad qualities, which were often one and the same. For my entire life, I longed for love. I knew it was not right for me as a girl and later as a woman to want or expect it, but I did. And this unjustified desire has been at the root of every problem I have experienced in my life. I dreamed that my mother would notice me and that she and the rest of my family would grow to love me. To win their affection, I was obedient, the ideal characteristic for someone of my sex. But I was too willing to do what they told me to do. Hoping they would show me even the most simple kindness, I tried to fulfill their expectations for me to attain the smallest bound feet in the county. So I let my bones be broken and molded into a better shape. When I knew I couldn't suffer another moment of pain and tears fell on my bloody bindings, my mother spoke softly into my ear, encouraging me to go one more hour, one more day, one more week, reminding me of the rewards I would have if I carried on a little longer. In this way, she taught me how to endure not just the physical trials of foot binding and childbearing, but the more torturous pain of the heart, mind, and soul. She was also pointing out my defects and teaching me how to use them to my benefit. In our country, we call this type of mother love tangai. My son has told me that in men's writing it is composed of two characters. The first means pain, the second means love. That is a mother's love. The binding altered not only my feet, but my whole character. And in a strange way, I feel as though that process continued throughout my life, changing me from a yielding child to a determined girl, then from a young woman who would follow without question whatever her in-laws demanded of her, to the highest ranked woman in the county who enforced strict village rules and customs. By the time I was 40, the rigidity of my foot binding had moved from my golden lilies to my heart which held on to injustices and grievances so strongly that I could no longer forgive those I loved and who loved me. My only rebellion came in the form of Nushu, our woman's secret writing. It appeared for the first time when Snowflower, my Lautong, my old same, sent me the fan that sits here on my table and then again after I met her. But apart from who I was with Snowflower, I was resolved to be an honorable wife a praiseworthy daughter-in-law, and a scrupulous mother. In bad times, my heart was as strong as jade. I had the hidden might to withstand tragedies and sorrows. But here I am, a widow, sitting quietly as tradition dictates, and I understand that I was blind for too many years. Except for three terrible months, in the fifth year of Emperor Shen Feng's reign, I have spent my life in upstairs women's rooms. Yes, I have gone to the temple, traveled back to my natal home, even visited with Snowflower, but I know little about the outer realm. I've heard men speak of taxes, drought, and uprisings, but these subjects are far removed from my life. What I know is embroidery, weaving, cooking, my husband's family, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and Nushu. My life course has been a normal one, daughter days, hairpinning days, rice and salt days, and now, sitting quietly. So here I am alone with my thoughts in this fan before me. 
When I pick it up, it's strange how light it feels in my hands, for it records so much joy and so much grief. I open it quickly, and the sound each fold makes as it spreads reminds me of a fluttering heart. Memories tear across my eyes. These last 40 years, I have read it so many times that it is memorized like a childhood song. I remember the day the intermediary handed it to me. My fingers trembled as I opened the folds. Back then, a simple garland of leaves adorned the upper edge, and only one message trickled down the first fold. At that time, I didn't know many characters in Nushu, so my aunt read the words. I understand there is a girl of good character and women's learning in your home. You and I are of the same year and the same day. Could we not be sames together? I look now at the gentle wisps that compose those lines and see not only the girl that Snowflower was, but the woman she would become, persevering, straightforward, outward looking. My eyes graze along the other folds and I see our optimism, our joy, our mutual admiration, our promises to each other. I see how that simple garland grew to be an elaborate design of interwoven snow blossoms and lilies to symbolize our two lives together as a pair of Lao Tong. I see the moon in the upper right hand corner shining down on us. We were to be like long vines with entwined roots, like trees that stand a thousand years, like a pair of mandarin ducks mated for life. On one fold, Snowflower wrote, we of good affection shall never sever our bond. But on another fold, I see the misunderstandings, the broken trust, and the final shutting of the door. For me, love was such a precious possession that I couldn't share it with anyone else, and it eventually cut me away from the one person who was my same. I'm still learning about love. I thought I understood it. Not just mother love, but the love for one's parents, for one's husband, and for one's lao tong. I've experienced the other types of love. Pity love, respectful love, gratitude love. But looking at our secret fan with its messages written between Snowflower and me over many years, I see that I didn't value the most important love, deep heart love. These last years, I have copied down many autobiographies for women who never learn new shoe. I have listened to every sadness and complaint, every injustice and tragedy. I have chronicled the miserable lives of the poorly fated. I have heard it all and written it all down. But if I know much about women's stories, then I know almost nothing about men's, except that they usually involve a farmer fighting against the elements, a soldier in battle, or a lone man on an interior quest. Looking at my own life, I see it draws from the stories of women and men. I am a lowly woman with the usual complaints, but inside I also wage something like a man's battle between my true nature and the person I should have been. I am writing these pages for those who reside in the afterworld. Peony, my grandson's wife, has promised to make sure that they are burned at my death so my story will reach them before my spirit does. Let my words explain my actions to my ancestors, to my husband, but most of all to Snowflower before I greet them again. So now Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, the whole book is this beautiful. <laughs> it's astonishing. Um, and I was wondering, Lisa, are you excited about the Dutch edition? Yes, of yes. course I am. Uh, you are? <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. And how do you feel about the jacket? I love this jacket. We've been talking about it, I know. I, I think it's such a beautiful and evocative um, jacket, and uh, I you won't tell anyone, but I don't really care for the American and English jacket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I really prefer this. I think it's um, just lovely and, and really has a, a actually a kind of an earthy feel that mm -hmm. I think is very central to the book. Right. So every country has its own jacket, yes, of course. But, so but that's what I love. Yeah. And what, what does it say about the Dutch, you think? 
Well, I wouldn't be able to say that. I don't know. <laughs> Good the, taste. How about that? Well, that, I go for that. Um, listen, you started out as a freelance journalist. Uh, did that prepare you for writing fiction, or do you feel that that's a totally different uh, way of writing? Actually, and my first book was nonfiction. I think that writing, people ask this question a lot, mm -hmm. what, which one's easier and, you know, that sort of thing. I think that writing, people have always said about my nonfiction that it reads like fiction and that often that my fiction reads like nonfiction. I can't tell you how many people have said that they thought that this was a true, that Snowflower is mm -hmm. a true autobiography of a woman who actually existed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that with nonfiction, there are certain things you're stuck with with nonfiction. You have to get, get you know, even if you have some bad years, you have to put them in somehow and you have to try to do it in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. With fiction, you still have that problem and so, but you can be a little more creative in how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can skip it a little bit, but with nonfiction, you're sort of stuck with the facts. Mm -hmm. So, do you still do uh, journalist work from time to time? Or? Very rarely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just actually, just recently, some magazines called me to do mm -hmm. some work, but I really don't do that much anymore. But would you say your heart is with writing fiction yes, now? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Why is it more fulfilling to you? Um, Well, I think when you have this opportunity to create characters who can uh, talk, uh, express parts of yourself or parts of your philosophy of mm -hmm. the world uh, that you might not be able to do in another way, um, often I think, well, and I think this is a good example because it's, a, it's historical fiction that people have said to me, why didn't you just write this as nonfiction? Why didn't you just write a magazine article about Nushu? And the problem with doing that is, uh, I think, often, that then you just, you really do just have the facts. You don't really get a sense of how this history actually had an impact on individual people. So often we learn history in terms of wars and dates, or you say, facts. oh, and you, yeah, facts. Yeah. And, Oh, you know, it's one thing to say across China for a thousand years the women were illiterate, mm -hmm. across China for a thousand years the women had bound feet. But what happens when you take one or two people and you say what that meant to them, mm -hmm. what that means? Mm -hmm. I, I think then as a reader you are able to feel that history and experience yeah. that history and, and experience, to it a lot more. experience the human mm -hmm. condition really right, in a right. way that you can't. Yeah, you get to write about emotions mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Well, that's because history has an impact on mm -hmm. individual people, mm -hmm. and that's what history really is, but that's not how we have tended to learn it or experience it. Mm -hmm. So writing thrillers uh, must have taught you a thing or two about uh, creating a plot, I can imagine. Yes, a thing or two. <laughs> a thing or two. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think think that actually that has really served me very well because mm -hmm. uh, so often now in contemporary fiction there's very you know sort of literary fiction there's very little plot they tend mm -hmm. to just be character studies but with a thriller or a mystery you have to have a plot and it has to work mm -hmm. and you have to have characters I think that you can care about in the same in, in just in the yeah. same way that I was saying before. Mm -hmm. So with this novel, I, I, there, you know, to have a plot that will work, that will keep people turning the pages is important to me. Mm -hmm. um, where I think maybe somebody else would have approached it slightly differently and just looked at it purely as a, as a character study. Mm -hmm. So did you have the plot in mind uh, when you started writing it or did that just occur to you later on? Well, I knew that these women would use a fan to have in the folds the most special moments of their lives. Mm -hmm. The births, the deaths, the marriages, uh, the wars, the family, you know, the, the, those moments that were the most important. And the other aspect of this language is it's a phonetic version of the local dialect. So because it's phonetic, 
it's there's a lot of room there for misinterpretation mm -hmm. for mistakes to be made I don't know how many of you know much about Chinese but um, in Mandarin there are five four main tones one neutral tone so you could take a word like ma and depending on how you pronounce it it can mean uh, mother horse scold hemp Wow uh, and a question mark Whoa. If I put it at the end of the sentence, it means it's a question. That too, wow. So, and, and that's just in Mandarin. That doesn't even talk about all mm -hmm. the other dialects. Or so there's a so, lot of room right. for so misinterpretation. It, so, right. So if you're just writing mm -hmm. a phonetic version of that, you're not going to have all, all of it. So I felt that in this fan, somewhere there would be something that would have caused a, a rift, a separation mm -hmm. of the friendship that really would be right. a, a misinterpretation of the written language. Right. So that she gives away a little bit now. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've often said that you might not look Chinese, but you are Chinese in your heart. Uh, in what way um, does writing about your Chinese <coughs> roots help you to understand your background? When I was working on On Gold Mountain, that's the first book about my family, I didn't think at all about my identity. Mm -hmm. I just was writing about my family. Right. And it wasn't until that book came out that people started, you know, people like you started mm -hmm. asking me, well, wh what are you? How do you feel? Are you Chinese? Are you American? Mm -hmm. um, what part of your identity do you most feel comfortable with? And that's when I really had to look at that and think about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, like most people, uh, who you are, you, your, your identity comes from who you see around you. They're your mirror. Your family is your mirror. Mm -hmm. Well, my mirror was all Chinese. And it actually, when I was working on, on that first book, I'd be talking to some relative and they would say, you know, oh, you know, you should go talk to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Caucasian like you. I had never realized that my family saw me as different than they were. Right. Uh, and so, but I, but I can't help how I was raised. I can't help how, what part I identify with. It's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a choice in it. So when I'm in, let's say, Chinatown, um, I don't look like I belong on the outside, but inside I'm completely at home. I feel the same thing when I'm in China. It's just a bigger version of Chinatown. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. And I don't look like I belong there either. Mm -hmm. But I feel I've, I really understand it because it's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. When you turn that around and I'm sort of in the larger Caucasian American society, I look like I belong, but often there are things that I don't understand or I don't get or I'm offended by. Um, so I think because of that, I, I really have been on a, on, a, on a ledge in a sense, you know, and, and that maybe, and I don't know if it's true, but I think that I can actually write about the Chinese experience about China in a way because I'm on, because I'm in both worlds, and translate that into a way that is not only um, understood and appreciated by the Chinese community, and they can say, "Oh, yes, this is this is true. This is feels right," mm -hmm. but that also other people can look at it and and understand it and and have a window into another culture. So build a bridge between these two cultures. Yeah. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, writing about your Chinese uh, background is one thing, but talking about it and have to answer questions it's about it. It's different. Did, yes. Yeah, <laughs> did something else. Mm -hmm. did, yeah. Um, and let's talk about the story, because it's, it's such an intriguing story. Um, it tells the, the hidden story of women's suffering, of course, in, in 19th century China. Um, did you feel that it was important to raise awareness of that with this book, of the suffering that happened? Uh, actually, that wasn't my thinking. You didn't have a mission to do no. that? No, I wasn't really thinking about that because, see, I would disagree with you in the sense that I 
even though this takes place in the 19th century and even though these women's lives are very difficult, uh, impossible, hard, hard in a sense to imagine, mm -hmm. to me it's not that far from where we are, how we live today. Uh, certainly we don't have our feet bound. We, we, by any measure you could say we're free, we're independent. I, I'm talking about men and women here and that but, but in many ways, I think we're still bound up, men and women, you know, mm -hmm. still bound up by, um, by family, by our careers and our jobs, by obligations, um, by events outside of our control like war or natural disasters. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this, is, this is common experience even today. Mm -hmm. And that even within that, I think we all long, in a sense, to, um, you know, fly out of that window of our lives and reach across the fields, whatever form they take, and find people who will listen to us, who want to hear about our lives, who will share their lives with us. Mm -hmm. This is this is part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, in writing about these women in the 19th century, I hope that people also look at their own lives today, look at their friendships, look at this idea of love, think about regret, think about these very you know, powerful emotions that we have that transcend time and culture and... and yeah, so time and culture still uh, limits us nowadays like it did then, and the question is, do you dare to uh, look outside of that? And um, what do you feel is the universal theme of the book? Is it finding um, somebody to, um, to share your thoughts with? You know, the, the universal, universal longing for friendship? Well, I do think that there's a universal longing to be heard. Yeah to be, have somebody or people who will listen to you, who are interested in you. I, I, so if you want to call that friendship, maybe it is friendship, but I think that that desire to be heard, to communicate your feelings, um, even under the most difficult, harshest circumstances, this is something that is innate in human beings. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering, um, do you consider yourself a feminist? Do you believe in a sisterhood of some kind? No, I don't know. No. I don't know. Sure, why not? <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I get, yeah, I'd have to say, yep, yeah, I'm a feminist. You're a feminist. But, and, but and what's I, your definition of that? I don't know that I have one. <laughs> no? Um, God, you guys ask hard <laughs> questions. <laughs> it is hard. Um, I mean, clearly I'm a woman of now the 21st century. How could I not be a feminist? But what's the definition of that? I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, there are certain obvious things you could say, like equal pay for equal mm -hmm. work, or a woman's right to choose, or you know that there are a lot of things. Um, but, but I don't know that I have a very deep personal um, mm -hmm. definition. But you, you just now talked about um, that women in, in the history books don't get the attention That's maybe true, they, they deserve. Don't. Yes, and yeah. I have tried w with this book, with the next book, w and all of the books actually, to find women's stories that have been lost, have been mm -hmm. forgotten, have been deliberately covered up in some cases, right. uh, and try to bring those out because, uh, just as I had said earlier, you know, so much of this, ha we always hear that women didn't do anything, and mm -hmm. yet they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. They clearly did. It's just that it's been lost. So what a wonderful, um, I think, you know, for example, that it's really important that we know that there was one place in the world, only one that we know of, where the women invented their own writing. It's the only gender-based written language that's been found in the world. Mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. I, and I think it's something that should really be celebrated. Yeah, and worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you're doing that. Exactly. So maybe there's a little bit of yeah. a mission there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the main character, Lily, um, she reminded you of your grandmother you mentioned in an uh, interview. Did you feel as though your grandmother was looking over your shoulder when you were writing it? Or different women from your family? Mm -hmm. Yeah? How did that inspire you? You know, those women really did grow up in a time when it was very hard. I think that, and yet, in my family, all of the women worked. They all were um, very brave and adventuring women. They all broke the law, mm. you know, to <laughs> really? get married. I mean, yeah. they, they were rebels in a sense. Um, but they also had very hard, hard lives uh, because of that. And I guess I, I'm able, when I'm writing, when I'm writing a book like this, um, to really call upon them. I, it's not so much that they're looking over my shoulder, but that I'm saying, come, come on over uh -huh. and tell, tell me what you know. Remind me, tell me those stories again. And how did that feel, just as a knowing or as a uh, helping hand, finding you the right resources? Uh, well, books? I have a, I think I, I feel very close to my family and that I was very close, you know, when they were living, I was very mm -hmm. close to them. And maybe I have a kind of a nostalgia to want to be with them. I mean, so much of my work has really been about being, continuing to be with them, right. even though they're gone. So, um, I don't know that it has to do with research. I think it just has to do with finding the right voice, with being true to the emotions, um, of being true to especially things like sorrow, mm -hmm. but, but also those moments of great happiness. Because, because again, so often when people have sorrowful lives or difficult lives, they can sometimes forget those joyous mm -hmm. moments in their lives. Sometimes Lily says, uh, let's, let's be happy now. This yeah. is a happy moment. Yeah, yeah. it's beautiful. Um, another thing you wrote was, uh, only through pain will you have beauty, only through suffering will you have peace, or at least Lily's told that. Um, there are many preconceptions and misconceptions about foot binding. Why was it done? Was it a beauty thing? Was it, what do you think? Well, there were actually several reasons. The first, uh, it was a great economic status symbol. Mm -hmm. um, a man could say, I am so wealthy that my wife can have bound feet, meaning she didn't, couldn't work. Mm -hmm. Could, didn't have to work and couldn't work couldn't work in the fields. Like in my family, we were all peasants. They all had big women, big, yeah. big feet. Big-footed you know, women. Big-footed <laughs> women. Um, a man could say, I'm so extraordinarily wealthy that not only does my wife have bound feet, but even our servants have bound feet. Mm. So there was that. Um, there was also the very basic thing that if a woman had bound feet, she couldn't run away. Uh-huh. Uh, hmm. Then, forgive me men, but men are men. And so there was the erotic component, and there was nothing more erotic, more intimate than for a man to hold a, a woman's naked bound foot in his hand. That was the top the thing, thing. The, the, <laughs> the big deal. Uh -huh. uh, and so there was that, and, but why did it persist? Why did it last for a thousand years? It was passed from mother to daughter, generation after yeah, generation. That's the weird thing, isn't it? And why did they do it? It was the one way that a mother could possibly change her daughter's future. Right. If she could give her daughter a perfect pair of bound feet, she might be able to mm -hmm. marry into a better family and have a better, a better life, right. a better future. So that's that hard uh, mother love that mm -hmm. you talked about earlier. Yeah. And that was, the, and I think that, I mean, all of those things are very separate, but that's, I think that that, when you get really down to it, if, because 
if you have children, can you imagine doing that? I mean, it's just impossible mm -hmm. to really imagine breaking your daughter's toes and making her walk making on them. Making her walk, yeah. And, and then breaking the, I mean, right. all of it is just, right. it's horrifying mm -hmm. to think of inflicting that kind of pain on a, on a little child, mm -hmm. someone supposedly you love. Right. Uh, and, and so the, the belief that this was the one way somebody could improve mm -hmm. her daughter's life. Yeah, it was for their benefit, mm -hmm. at least they thought. Yes, I got the feeling uh, when I read it that um, that that was one of the reasons why the mother didn't the mothers didn't really were that close to the daughters because they wanted to protect themselves from loving them too much because they knew they had to hurt them. Did you feel that as well? Well, I don't know if that's really true. I mean, I think that that's maybe true as mm -hmm. a practical matter, but also. Of girls were not expected to receive love. They weren't considered part of the family mm -hmm. that they were born into. The, your, the, the natal family, the family that she was a girl was born into, they looked at it as though they were raising this girl for her husband's family. She was never going to be in the ancestral temple, a name in the ancestral right. temple. She would be in her husband's family mm -hmm. temple. So she was not seen really as being part of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and can I just say one other thing yeah, sure. about, um, of course now it's gone out of my mind. <laughs> oh, about foot binding, which is women saw this also as, as something that they could really be proud of, that uh, there were contests, you know, village contests, who has the smallest, most perfect feet. Um, this was something, and I, and I, you know, again, being on tour, I've met a lot of people who, their grandmothers had bound feet, and they were very, very proud of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know that they were considered beautiful, and so I think that also was an element that yeah. that how people's concept of beauty changes. Mm -hmm. And also, this was something that they did. They, they did. bound right. the, the feet from their daughters, and they. Oh look, we still, you know, we today. What do we have? We have cosmetic surgery yeah. and women getting those, you know, big Huge, gigantic yeah. Yeah. breasts. And why? Why did they do it? The exact same reasons that uh, women bound their feet. Yeah, yeah. But I read somewhere that you don't like to compare foot binding to those things. You know, just like female genital mutilation. No, I do. I no, I do. The opposite. I think do really. I do think that the these. Same. I mean, it, it is the same. Right. You know the same kind of thing, the same reasons, the same economic, erotic, mm -hmm. all, you know, status, all of that. It's yeah. still, sense of beauty, all of that is still yeah. very much there. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. Um, when did foot binding stop? Uh, it was banned in 1911 with the for found formation of the Republic in China. Right. Uh, but in this area, in Jianyang County, it's, you know, it's very remote, and they didn't get word. They didn't hear. Oh. And they didn't hear that Mao had taken over the country in 1949. They didn't hear that My either. God, that's very so, remote. <laughs> so they didn't hear until 1952. Really? And so it had lingered. I mean, first they, they had a new government, and oh, by the way, foot binding's been outlawed for now about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they just hadn't. So you know. that's why you went over there to find well, one of the lost women. Well, but that's also where they, that's the only place that they had this secret language. Right, was oh, in this of course, one yeah. Because are there still women alive uh, like Lily today? Who had bound feet? Yes. Yeah. But they're dying, I mean, they are yeah. dying out. There aren't that many yeah. left. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to talk about was the, the Lao Tong. Mm -hmm. You say that. Lao Tong, right? right. Um, the old sayings, um, they were uh, linked together in lifelong emotional matches. Uh, and Lily was linked to Snowflower, of course. Um, why do you think that tradition existed just to, because of the loneliness of the women, because they wanted to, um, to have, uh, to create something for them? Yes. Yeah. Otherwise yes. it would have been but it was, it, No, again, it was a very rare, relationship mm -hmm. um, you know it has evolved and there are forms of that relationship even today but it, now you would just look at it always oh, my best friend 
it's not so formalized with mm -hmm. a contract that it lasts for life. It's just you would say, oh, it's you know, it's my Lao Tong, it's my mm -hmm. best friend. Mm -hmm. um, but and they went to the temple every year, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that's also part of being a Lao Tong. Yes, and that, that was uh, banned. Uh, yes, at a certain period. Of time. Yes, again uh, during the Cultural Revolution, those trips to the temple um, were 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 banned actually throughout China, all of that mm -hmm. kind of activity was banned, but in this area as well. And right. uh, was one of the things that led to the, the end of um, the language, really. Mm -hmm. So um, Sandor Marai, the Hong Hungarian writer you might have heard about, he wrote that we all need a witness to our lives, a person who defines our existence. Do you think that was what the relationship between Lily and Snowflower was all about? Being each other's witness through all the suffering and heartache and... And, mm -hmm. and, and I do think we need that. Mm -hmm. I think we all need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause, um, and, and it's not just the suffering. It is the things that happen that are wonderful, that you want people to share in that with you. Someone mm -hmm. who can be a part of it, who can cheer you on, comfort you, mm -hmm. whatever you need that, that's there and, and is a witness, mm -hmm. in, in that sense of the word yeah. of being a witness. Just knowing about it mm -hmm. is, is sometimes enough. Mm -hmm. Somebody to, to know about your, your deepest well, feeling. Uh, and you know, how many of us are really, in the great scheme of things, very heroic? We're just trying to get through life day to day, mm -hmm. right? At the end of our lives, you know, it's not very many of us who can say, I invented, hmm. you know, the internet, or right. I, you know, I uh, was president, or I was a king, or, mm -hmm. you know, very few of us can say that. We really only have small moment, successes in our lives, moments in our lives, and this is part of the way that we live on is through those people who knew us, who remember this, who, who saw us, who right. witnessed it. Right, yeah. And witnessed our, our, our bravery, because I really do think just to go through life, you have to be pretty brave, even if it's a quiet life. You mm -hmm. have to be brave to get up in the morning and just go on. Yeah, definitely. Um, and because women lived in total seclusion, uh, they developed their own secret uh, phonetical code, eh, the new shoe we talked about. Um, and it disappeared long ago. Um, and you told a little bit about how you discovered a uh, new shoe, but could you tell us something more about uh, on why it was banned and, and how uh, people started to rediscover it again? And right. Using well, it, it hadn't. Again. It really hadn't disappeared. It was really flourishing when that old woman fainted in the train station. Mm -hmm. And again, because it was the Cultural Revolution, they, the authorities and the Red Guard, looked at this as one of the four olds, a kind of a feudal holdover that should be destroyed, should be wiped out of society. Right. And so those women who practiced Nushu were publicly punished. They, you know, their writings were burned. They were made to do things like kneel in glass in the public square. Uh, so it did almost disappear because of that. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, no, the, certainly the, young, the generations younger did not learn the language because it was, it, it was seen as this bad mm -hmm. thing. And it was just about ready to die out when the Chinese government really reversed its position uh, they're looking at this not as one of the official 40 languages of China, but as a kind of um, national cultural treasure. Right. And so they, when I was there in 2002, they were building a big new shoe school, actually a complex of buildings, um, where they are going to be teaching new shoe to the younger generation as a way to try to keep it alive, keep it from disappearing, becoming extinct. But those young women are learning the language uh, in a very different way. It will no longer have that deep meaning to them mm -hmm. because if they want to talk to their friends, they go outside 
and talk on the street sure. or they call on their cell phones right. you know they don't ha they're not living in seclusion mm -hmm. and so really women are learning it like you would a folk dance or how to make a basket mm -hmm. or something like that you know as a as a sort folk of tradition art, art form yeah. right or a folk yeah. tradition yeah um, Last question before we, we go to uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, how did this book change you as a person? Did it change you as a person, I feel? Um, actually, it did. <laughs> I was about halfway through writing it when I had a very bad concussion. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't allowed to drive for three months. I live in Los Angeles. This is a big, big problem if you don't <laughs> yeah. drive in Los Angeles. I live at the top of a hill. Um, it's a long way to anything else. And so for three months, I really was at home alone. My bedroom has two windows, not one window. But I really had a very personal experience of that isolation mm -hmm. in a way that I really you know, I thought I had been imagining it very well, but once I had that experience, I, I, um, I really was very cut off. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of you have had this experience in your own lives when there has been an emergency or an illness, and there are certain people you think are the ones who will come around and help you, mm -hmm. but they aren't the ones yeah. who come around. Yeah. They're it's a neighbor that you yeah, hardly it's even hard, talk to. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. Uh, and there were about five women who came out of nowhere and came and, and took care of me. They took me to doctor's appointments. They came and kept me company. Um, and, I w and I really was going to a lot of doctor's appointments and sitting in those waiting mm -hmm. rooms for long periods of time. They just would, would just stay with me. Mm -hmm. And so not only did I have the, feel, the experience of the isolation, but also what it would have meant to have a sworn sisterhood of people who, of women who really would come and, and um, su support, support me. You. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. In a way that I had not had before in my right. life. So you wrote about it and then you experienced and it, it yourself. At the same time. Funny how that always happens when you write yeah, a but, book. I don't but know. But that why makes that me is. nervous about the next yeah. one. <laughs> Be careful what, yeah, you what I choose. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for now, uh, Lisa. I hope we have some questions, uh, some people who'd like to. And maybe you can come up to the microphone so we can. If you were from a lower class family, none of the girls had their feet bound. Um, Girls who didn't have their feet bound, they ended up as you know servants, peasants, what was also called little daughters-in-law. We had this in our family, girls who would be sold to other, to other families to be first servants and then concubines um, from when they're six years old. Uh, no, the women were not carried, they did walk. They could walk much further than you would expect. Uh, I actually set this book in the time that I did because during the Taiping, because I wanted to use what happened during the Taiping Rebellion. And I had found an old new shoe um, history that had been written by a woman about the Taiping Rebellion and what had happened. And when the Taiping rebe rebels came into this county, 10,000 people left their homes and went up into the mountains. Uh, and they had to climb this, this very steep mountain cliff pathway. And it was winter and snowy and icy. And so these women, you can imagine walking up a cliff like that with just three, you know, with, on your thumbs. Uh, and so many of the women fell from, their, from off the mountain. But they got up there. They lived out there in the wild for three months. And then once the rebels and that all had calmed down, they walked back down. And more women died on the way down the hill than going up because they were top heavy and they were just pulled off the mountain. But I really wanted to use that story because, again, you know, there is this idea that women couldn't walk. But in fact, they could. And, and especially if their lives were in danger, 
they could they could walk very far. And then the last question had to do with how did I communicate when I was there. I grew up hearing Cantonese. I can understand a fair amount. Um, I studied Mandarin for a long time and immediately forgot it as soon as I stopped studying. Uh, so I, uh, this was in the Hunan province and so I had an interpreter who spoke the Hunan dialect. I also had with me, this was a, clo is a closed area in China and so to be there I also had to travel with a man who was like the um, deputy mayor of the county. And so, and again, we were walking from village to village, a half a mile, a mile apart, very, you know, very close. Even today, they are so isolated from each other, and it's so remote, that the dialect would change from village to village. And so, um, I don't know if you know this, but written Chinese, it's all, that standard, no matter where you are, no matter what the dialect is. And so a lot of time would be spent saying, well, you know, do you mean this character? Writing it on your hands. Do you mean this character or that character? So that's, that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with a question? Just come up to the mic, please. Yes. My name is Tia Luc. I read your book and I loved it. Um, I think that feminism is maybe being able to choose your own life. Maybe a little bit closer to the mic yeah, might help. Yeah. Well, yes. I think that feminism is maybe about choosing your own life, which is the exact opposite from the women <coughs> in your book. <coughs> so what amazed me was the relative freedom of traveling. They could leave the family of their husbands and go back to their own family. During travel. the festivals. But during the festivals. So then you have to yeah. remember why they were sent back. Those festivals usually had to do, you know, were at the beginning of planting season, mm -hmm. for example, which meant that all of the stores and everything that had been saved up, they really didn't have any food left. So most of the festivals had to do with sending a, a wife away yes. back to her natal family when there was no food in the house because they didn't want to feed her. It was more practical. Yeah, it was really and, practical. And it really had to do with whether or not they wanted to feed mm -hmm. this woman. Um, and so they would send her back to her natal family. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Maybe about um, uh, the writing process? Or, well, let me ask uh, a question then. Uh, about the writing process, do you have any rituals? There are some weird rituals <laughs> out there. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I don't writers. have any. <laughs> no, you just uh, yeah, no, sit I, yeah, I behind just your desk and start writing yeah. in the morning. Just office hours or? Um, I check my email first, and then I, I that's like a warm up. <laughs> right. I drink a lot of tea. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm very boring that way. No, I don't no, have any. I don't have practical. any any rituals. I and wish I did. And when is the best time for you morning. To, in the morning? Yeah, you're most uh, creative then. Yeah, and never a night where you just go never on. Never at night. And no, by nighttime I'm too tired. Right, right. <laughs> well, obviously it it works for you because a lot yeah. of a lot of great books uh, came out of that. Well, yeah. So Did the everybody question get is, that? Yeah, yeah, so the question is, how do I do the plot and do I have that in my head to begin with or does that change as I go along and materialize as it goes along? I actually do work with an outline. I have some idea of what's going to happen. But you have to be willing for the magic to happen. There are always things that happen that you didn't know were going to happen. The end of this. Book. I usually know the beginning and the end, and I'm not so sure about what's going to happen in the middle. But the end of this was a total surprise to me. Um, I, I mean, I really was, I, I was really happy when it happened the way that it did, but I was completely surprised by it. I think the best example was, um, what 
book was this? Uh, the, my book, The Interior, which was a mystery thriller. And, you know, there's a dead body on page one. And I knew who, I knew from the beginning who the killer was. I mean, I knew that because I knew the end. But there was one day I was writing and I was working and, and all of a sudden, you know, I was writing and it turned out it was somebody else. <laughs> and it, I mean, and it, you know, I was like, well, okay, you know. <laughs> you have and to so obey. I, yeah, and I just wrote it. I was like, yeah, that's right, it is that guy. You know, he, he this, it was this person. Yeah. That other one was a bad guy anyway, but it was this person who committed that murder that was up there on page one. So I thought, well, I have to go back to page one, and you know, we were talking about plotting before. I have to put in all the clues and really lay the groundwork to make sure that this works. Well, I went back. He wasn't on page one, but he was on page three. Mm. And he was there all along in the ways that he needed to be there. I didn't plan it. It just happened, and he and he he was a, he really was evil because he had <laughs> snuck into that book without right, my knowing about right. it. Um, but but I think that's where you know when you you have to allow um, you have your conscious mind, but you also have to let that kind of unconscious magical part happen, um, and 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 be willing. For, for it to happen. Mm -hmm. You can't be too rational about it. No. 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 Another question, yeah, yes. Question. I wonder, do you ever have to sort of motivate yourself where you have to say, okay, now I'm sitting down, or does it flow every day that you sit down? And oh, well, of course, for me, every time I sit down, I'm ready. No, of course <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, that's why the email, that's yeah. just an excuse. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what I the way I feel about it, and, and I don't write every day, but when I'm writing, I try to work for three or four months at a time and, and not do anything else. Um, you can't work for a day and take three days off and work for a day and take a week off. I mean, I just really try to work in a, in a long period. I'm not waiting for inspiration, but I'm waiting for a big chunk of time. Once I have that chunk of time, uh, a thousand words a day at least, no matter what, even if it's bad, it's a thousand words, and you just have to sit there until it's done. Um, I, I think it's a big mistake to wait for that one moment of inspiration, because you could wait a long time, <laughs> and there, there are a lot of things that can come along the way, like even washing dishes is sometimes better than waiting for that one yeah. moment of inspiration. Oh. So if you can just Make yourself do the thousand words a day. That means at the end of one week, you have 20 pages. At the end of two weeks, you have 40. You can do the math. Um, you can always go back and fix it. And I really, I, I really believe that real writing happens in the editing. That the first part, the first is just an un it's, a, it's, it's like a dream, the first draft. It's just the, the unconscious, m you know, mush. Uh, and then you really <coughs> mold it into something in, in the editing process. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. OK. Another question? Uh, I have a technical question about my question. Maybe. Well, we will repeat it. Yeah? OK. Right. So I think the real question, I mean, the, 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 how, did, how was the language invented? How is it used? What does it look like? So I'll work backwards. Um, Chinese, standard Chinese, it's actually, it's very square. Uh, the, the, the strokes are very heavy. They have real weight to them. Um, New Shu only has six strokes, so it's much simpler. In, in how you do it, 
the, the strokes are very long and thin. The characters are very long and thin. It's been described as looking like mosquito legs. It doesn't look at all like standard Chinese. Um, mosquito legs or bird prints on the sand, you know, very long, thin. Um, they don't really know who invented it, how it started, but there is a legend. And the legend is that about a thousand years ago, uh, the emperor went to Jianyang County, met a farmer who was educated, and his daughter who was educated, who, who was literate. And he decided to take her back to the palace as a concubine. You'd think that would be the happy ending. No longer a farmer's daughter, now you're in the palace. But in fact, once she got there, uh, she was very lonely, very sad. The people looked at her as, oh, she's just a country bumpkin. And she wanted to write home to her mother and sisters to say how unhappy she was. But she thought that if she wrote in standard Chinese that she would be thrown in the well or her head would be cut off, she'd be killed. Uh, and so she invented this secret code to write home to her mother and sisters. Now, what's the problem with that story? How could they read it? So I, uh, th that concubine did exist. She's a, she is a real person. She was from that area. I think often sisters already will speak in a secret code, have their own way of, of whether it's written or just a verbal language. I think they probably had some of that already. Uh, some of the characters are actually italicized versions of standard Chinese, but there is also a theory that uh, this is an old archaic language that, that may have actually been abandoned by men or had been invented by women, but, you know, either way, but it had really lost favor and, and only carried on in this one area. So it may be a combination of all three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, back. Is there two questions in the back? Yeah. Good evening. I have two questions. The first uh, is about uh, the secret language. Uh, did the men not know at all the women were communicating in this way? And the second question is about uh, these old sayings. Um, uh, were it only the two old sayings they uh, that were allowed to, uh, to have contact with each other or also other women that were all same or? So, um, the first question was? First question was about, uh, yeah. Uh, or if it oh, was yes. Men so really it was supposed know. to be a big secret. Um, and there were a lot of traditions. Men were never allowed to touch it. They could never touch Nushu. And they were not supposed to know it existed. But it was an open secret. They knew it existed. They saw the women writing it. They didn't care. It was something that women did. It was like cooking or taking care of a baby. It was just a woman's thing. Um, they sometimes even wore it because it was embroidered or woven into their clothes. I'd like to know what some of those things said. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Given how harsh those men were, I'd like, you know, my husband really is a pig. Um, <laughs> or, he's not, or my husband, he's not so bad. Um, uh, and then the question about the old sames, this was a very particular relationship. Two women uh, that were allowed to visit throughout the year, who were allowed to write to each other throughout the year. Otherwise, they, women really didn't have that. They had it until they were 17 in these sworn sisterhoods, and then the, when they married, then that was it. And then once they moved into their husband's home, they really only had the company of their mother-in-law and sisters-in-law. Okay, maybe one last question. Or we'll just, yeah, I thought you had a... There is some text left of the language. Uh, there are about 175 old documents, um, old letters, stories, autobiographies, songs that have been kept. 
um, there have, I don't know if there are recordings, but I know there's one documentary that was made about Nushu in which there are women who are singing the language. Um, a lot of this was, and this was one of the ways that, that uh, helped uh, teach, was a way that they helped teach it to girls, was that it was written at, in rhyme as songs so it, with very standard types of phrases. And so women would get together and they would chant stories or they would chant particular songs. Mm -hmm. And this was ha helped little girls to learn it. So there is one documentary that, ch that has some of that chanting in it. But okay. that's the only one that I know of. Okay. I believe Monique will say a few words. Thank you first, um, Lisa C., for your wonderful uh, book you wrote and the wonderful stories you talked about. I think you opened up a window for us. It was, um, I lived in China for six years and uh, I was amazed by the story, I think like you are. And it, was, it really gave me the feeling that um, you are Chinese, the way you write. So I think it's a remarkable achievement. And it was a wonderful talk you did, so thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, you can. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you, Suzanne, for giving the introduction and you know warming up the audience. Thank you, audience, for giving posing such a nice questions uh, tonight. Um, Lisa told me that she is uh, willing to sign your books if you like. Uh, she will do that from this table, and it leaves me now to uh, welcome you all to stay a little longer, talk a little longer. Uh, there will be more China on our John Adams Institutes. Uh, fall season, we are joining the Amsterdam China Festival with a, an evening on the 12th and on the 13th of October, one with Chinese poetry, also poetry from people who moved to the US from China. And the other evening we have something with, uh, about superpowers. Is America going to lose it? Is China coming up? <laughs> we don't know. Um, but the next lecture is not something about China, it's something different. It's about America, of course. It's written, uh, it's a book published, a very important book. Uh, it's called The European Dream, written by Jeremy Rifkin. He will talk uh, the 22nd of September in Christophori here in Amsterdam, and there's still tickets available, so if you're interested, you can sign up at our information booth, where you can find much more information about the John Adams Institute. That's it for now. Thank you all for coming tonight, and um, a wonderful time um, again uh, Lisa, Lisa for, for being here and hope you have a pleasant time and trip back. Thank you very much. <laughs>